If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I never would have guessed that hard seltzer water would be so popular. Laugh all you want, but hard seltzer is a fantastic day drinker and likely isn't going anywhere in the near future. Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain, W04 Paramount, can help brewers get the most out of their seltzer fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols and it's produced in a gluten-free medium. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle, and Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 Paramount. Check it out at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. Do you remember the first time you had a barrel fermented beer, like a Lambic or a Guza? It was tart, right? Sour and likely also had something a little funky going on. What causes those distinctive flavors? It turns out that the sourness and funkiness comes from bacteria and yeasts that survive inside the wood of a barrel. So some bacteria and yeast can penetrate over a centimeter into the wood for safety uh, and for access to resources like sugar that they can consume to survive. So in the presence of unfermented wort or beer, those tiny microorganisms work their way out of the barrel or out of the wood and form a new biome that is a community of creatures that sort of work together and against each other and produce those desired flavor characteristics like sourness and funkiness. My guest in the lab today is Dr. Avi Shayevitz of Lalamond, who did a significant portion of his doctoral work looking at the microbiome and mycobiome that exists inside a barrel of beer. So in this study, he cataloged the various microorganisms that were present in a, a spontaneously fermented American cool ship ale, an ale aged sour beer, and an imperial porter to just see what impact these creatures were having on beer character. So we'll look at the results from his study and draw some interesting conclusions. So spoiler alert, things might not be as diverse as you expect. Please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy by visiting patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By becoming a patron, you'll receive rewards for your support, like access to unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to live monthly Q&A sessions. You just missed Brewlosophy's Andy Carter, but this month we've got Mike Myers. Yes, that Mike Myers. No, not the actor. The one from Root Shoot Malt in Colorado. Um, he'll be discussing craft malting in general, and he'll also be able to answer Answer any questions you have about Root Shoot Malt, which is a uh, contributor Jake Houlihan's current favorite malt, I believe. So to be a part of this session, head on over to patreon.com slash brewlosophy. If you like what you're hearing and want us to keep doing what we're doing, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. And if Apple is your provider of choice, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps people find us who might be interested in brewing-related science-y shows, and it helps us make sure that we're bringing you the best content. Feedback is brought to you by Haas, who in collaboration with Yakima Valley's Brew Lot Farms developed Brew One Hops, a variety that packs a wallop of tropical fruit character. As Hopped Up IPA continues to grow in popularity, many brewers are focusing on making theirs as juicy as possible, and Brew One does just that, imparting pungent notes of ripe pineapple and stone fruit while also contributing a very pleasing bitterness. You've heard me say it a bunch of times, and it's true that Brew One, in conjunction with Sabro, makes a fantastic fantastic pina colada flavored beer that's perfect for the summer months. So learn more about this variety as well as all of the other innovative hop products Hop Haas has to offer over at johnihaas.com. That's john, the letter I, H-A-A-S.com. And continuing from last week, listener Leandro wrote in with some questions for Dr. Marshall Laguerre about using CO2 aroma extracts in the Whirlpool. So here's another one of Leandro's questions and Dr. Laguerre's response. Leandro asks, I'm a bit puzzled by the results related to the fatty acid esters. So for listeners, the Incognito beer showed about 20% higher fatty acid esters after the dry hop, but not before the dry hop, which is odd. So, uh, 
Uh, Leandro writes, I don't understand how the percent difference can be less than 5% when sampled prior to dry hopping and increase to almost 20% after dry hopping. It means that the dry hop added more fatty acid esters to the incognito beer than the T90 beer. Yet in both these cases, the addition was coming from the same lot of pellets. How do you explain that both beers had a similar level of fatty acid esters pre-dry hopping and such a big difference post-dry hopping? It I must clearly have misunderstood something. Uh, Dr. Laguerre writes back, Leandro, we also do not understand the fatty acid esters in that experiment. Most people will tell you that the fatty acid esters esters come from the yeast during fermentation and the grains, which is at least partially true. But as you can see from our data, we saw a substantial difference in fatty acid esters between the pellet and incognito beers after dry hopping, and we are not sure why that is. I can tell you that if you monitor a fermentation without dry hop, you will see an increase in fatty acid esters throughout the fermentation, suggesting that the yeast are making the fatty acid esters, but dry hop will increase this ester production uh, to the extent to how much is unclear and why that may be different from incognito versus pellets is also unclear. My guess is that the hop fats or other hop components are possibly feeding the yeast to create more fatty acid esters during fermentation, but I have not proven this through experiment yet. So back to Cade. Uh, yeah, so I included this question as an example of the things that we don't know yet about hops and hop compounds. And Incognito is still a relatively new product. Um, and I always try to do a couple of minutes at the end of each episode talking with the guest about future uh, areas for research. And this is a very good example of something that Dr. Laguerre is researching. Those fatty acid esters might be responsible for tasters perceiving a difference in the Incognito beer and the T90 beer. And if that's the case, it opens up a whole new set of questions. So this is why I love science. All right, it's time for a break. Uh, Then we'll be back discussing the barrel-induced variation in the microbiome and mycobiome of beer with Dr. Avi Shevitz. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the time's IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. One of the difficulties of barrel aging beers is that you don't ever really know what you're going to get out of it. Is this going to have nice vanilla and oak character or is it going to taste like vinegar? And the answer to that question starts with understanding what microbes exist in in barrels. So what are we playing with and what contributions do they make to flavor, aroma, appearance, and mouthfeel? Well, joining us in the lab today is Avi Shayevitz, who's a research associate in the brewing R&D department with Lalamond. And he's here to discuss a paper that he wrote looking at the barrel microbiome and mycobiome. Don't worry, we'll talk about what those terms mean in a little bit. Uh, And their unique impact on the characteristics of beer. So Avi, welcome to the Brew Lab. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. Um, You know, a lot of brewers are barrel aging beers these days. I mean, even small breweries and and some home brewers have a barrel or two laying around. So I I think your research looking at the microorganisms and how they, you know, what they contribute to beer and then seeing if we can, you know, maybe establish any trends that might help brewers understand when a batch is uh, quote unquote ready. uh, That's pretty neat stuff. Yeah, it's... um it's kind of a, a a rather under explored and underappreciated niche within the 
brewing science community, I feel like, especially now as we'll get into it, like some of the modern technologies that are much more available, much more affordable to researchers. Yeah, I mean, that was one, that's one thing we're definitely going to talk about. You used some next generation um, yeast sequencing, but we'll get into that uh, um, in a little bit. But I do always want to start off the show by talking a little bit about you. <laughs> so you are a, uh, like I said, a brewing R&D research associate at Lalamond. That's a pretty big deal. Tell me about it. Sure. Um, so basically, I work in the Lalamonds, or I work for Lalamond Incorporated, uh, which is headquartered in Montreal, Canada. And uh, my day-to-day operations is basically uh, centered around developing new um, products or improving new techniques for use of existing products that Lalamond off- offers. So this could be anywhere from new yeast strains uh, for new or already established styles of beer, uh, nutritional aids for fermentation, or entirely new products uh, like souring bacteria that don't, you know, microorganism, microorganisms that may not have anything to do with yeast itself. Um, because the company actually deals with a lot more than just yeast. So it's basically anything that has to do with the microbiology of food and food science. Oh, that's really cool. So you get to play with all of the fun stuff uh, and see what y'all are going to release out for, for you know, home brewers and brewers to be able to use. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been great so far. So I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> that's good. Um, and uh, you and I actually met um, a couple of weeks ago on a uh, chat, which was uh, the uh, Association of Brewing Chemists has a like a chapter here at Oregon State University. Now, Avi's actually an alumni of Oregon State. Um, and so we, we met on a chat, uh, and you were talking about, we, well, I was talking about Philly Sour, which was an episode that, that, uh, we did a while back and you started telling me about Sour Vissier, um, and your work, um, on that, which I'd love to have you back in a future episode to talk about that. But, uh, you know, this one that we're talking about today, I think is also just really fascinating. The, the microbiome of a barrel. So how did you get interested in studying brewing science? Uh, that's kind of kind of a long history that goes back. <laughs> um, so when I did my first undergraduate degree, uh, I was I was at, at Michigan, and um, so I had focused primarily on chemical biology, which is different than biochemistry because chemical biology is more looking for ways to use biological chemistry or biological systems to solve chemistry problems. And this ranges anywhere from biofuels to new medications to genetically modifying organisms to kind of get them to do things that you want to do at an industrial scale. So everything ranging from um, medicine to food has at least some impact or or at least some origin in uh, chemical biology. And so my interest actually got started when I was working. I uh, was lucky enough to do an undergrad research project with my genetics professor at the time, and we were looking into uh, the genome of tomato blight, which is a fungus, uh, septoria, excuse me, septoria like a persicae. And um, working closely with her, um, she introduced me to her husband, who was a home brewer. And that's kind of where I started doing this, like back, I think I was just barely 21 at the time. And that kind of like, that, that just made something click because this was back in, I don't know, like, 2010 and um that was really kind of seeing the start of the craft beer uh trend or phenomenon in the michigan area and from there i kind of just slowly started becoming more and more interested into it and then after i graduated college for the first time uh, i got into um I got into industrial chemistry, you know, mostly associated with the auto industry. And then I discovered that Oregon State actually has an entire food science division. Yeah. And I got into contact with some of the professors there, had some talk, decided to do my post back. And then, yeah, just kind of fell in love with the whole process after being able to do some hands-on stuff. Uh, because the, as, as you know, the food science program at Oregon State is, is very well established. Um, 
has an excellent brewing program. And now I'm, uh, I mean, they even have a greater focus on brewing microbiology. So I had met Dr. Chris Curtin during my time there as when he was coming to, uh, to interview for the associate professor position that he's now in. And we kind of hit it off. So he invited me to be his first master's student and I jumped at that opportunity. <laughs> oh, wow. I, you know, the, so much of that reminds me of, of my story or, or at least where I want to ho- hope to be uh, right a, a, in a few years, uh, going back and doing your post back after a number of years working and then, uh, you know, trying to get into grad school. So but that's a that's a really cool. That's a fascinating story. And it's really interesting that it's not it's not all that unique um, amongst brewers. Right. A lot of yeah, people are yeah. doing it. Um, which is which is great, and I love it. But uh, so let's get into the study uh, a little bit. So just a quick summary of the study. So what you did? So you used next generation sequencing to profile the microbiome and mycobiome of three different beers, and those beers were an American Cool Ship Ale, an aged sour ale, and an Imperial. Porter. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool, right? I mean, this is this is going to look at, um, you know, microbiome and mycobiome. So maybe I guess we should start right there. I've said mycobiome and microbiome a number of times. What am I talking about? Uh, so this is something that, that it's a very important concept. Um, and, and this this is something that followed me from my uh, from my first undergraduate study or, or my first undergraduate program in chemical biology. And that uh, the microbiome in a broad sense really just means the entire, you can, you could think of it as either like the entire global web of interactions between microorganisms at a global scale, or you could think about it in more of a contained uh, system. So when you look at a at a human body or, I mean, just about any animal body, complex animal body, um, but we'll use humans as the example. Uh, We're covered in microorganisms. Like, it's not just us, you know. Um, We have, we are a kind of like a small universe in and of ourselves because we play host to millions of species of microorganisms or at least you know hundreds of thousands of species some of them even probably undocumented just because there are so many out there and it's kind of like that delicate interplay between all of those species so um you have species of fungus and bacteria that are almost exclusive to human skin our guts our mouths um even even within uh, our bloodstream and the microbiome refers specifically to fungus. So microbiome is, is more of a broad um, picture at the, at the complete microorganism. I see. Um, ecology and a microbiome is kind of like just mostly focused or is entirely focusing on the fungal ecology. Okay. And by fungal ecology, the things we're interested in in brewers are not really mushrooms, although maybe, I mean, plenty of people brewing with mushrooms, right? Uh, (laughs) But it's yeast, right? Yeast is part of uh, the fungus kingdom. Yes. All right. Cool. Uh, All right. So, and, and that microbiome and mycobiome, like you said, it exists on the human body and it also exists in barrels, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So why don't you uh, sort of talk to us a little bit about that? I mean, I know we, we, we talk about, um, you know, aging beer in barrels, but that's really just fermentation, isn't it? Uh, It is, it is a type of fermentation, um, but it's a bit more complex than that. So when we look at the barrel microbiome, these are, so barrels are, are very complex systems. They're made from living tissue. Uh, so we, we use wood or once living tissue, I should say. And the, this tissue plays host. It's a perfect environment for many different types of organisms. So you have dozens of species of bacteria, dozens of species of, of fungi in the form of single celled yeast um, that call that can call that tissue home. And the beer is essentially a nutrient media. Now, beer itself is a surprisingly poor media. It's very selective uh, in that we can only really use it to culture or grow uh, a specific range of organisms. 
Um, and this is exactly what we see in these uh, in these barrels. Now, many of those organisms are considered spoilage organisms. And when you know when people hear me say, "Oh, beer is a bad media," they're they're probably shaking their heads. You know, thinking like. Like, what do you mean? Like my work can spoil super easy. It's like, well, yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's very highly tailored to specific organisms that are mostly associated with human activity. It's, I mean, this is just a result of 10,000 years of, of, of brewing, you know, we kind of bring these organisms with us. Yeah. I, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? Like we're, we're, you know, we're looking at just yeast, but we're the ones that are introducing the yeast for the most part, mm-hmm. right. That that's doing the job. Uh, but in barrels, they have their own, uh, like you said, a web of, you know, connected microorganisms because they were once living tissue. So they're sort of, it, it kind of, it can bring its own, uh, I don't know, bring its own uh, party members, right? Like bring its own tools to, to uh, ferment work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's cool. So, so we, we talk about then, I, I guess, oftentimes, you know, primary fermentation and secondary fermentation in barrels. And I'm guessing most of our listeners are, are going to understand that means, you know, uh, just putting the, the beer into the barrel and just letting it go, right, initially in the barrel versus secondary fermentation, which would be like fermenting in a tank um, or a carboy or something like that, and then transferring it into the barrel and doing some sort of secondary fermentation, letting those microbes of the barrel uh, do its thing. What are, you know, just kind of real generally, what are some, you know, benefits um, and maybe even some problems that those microbe organisms would contribute from barrels? Uh, so you can have an overpopulation of certain organisms that produce um, undesirable flavors. So when we think of these secondary fermentations, so you, yeah, you have your primary fermentation, which is your ethanol fermentation, then you have your secondary fermentation, which is basically everything else, um, because it doesn't stop at the yeast, or sorry, it doesn't stop with Saccharomyces cerevisiae producing alcohol. Um, basically, what's happening at that point is Saccharomyces cerevisiae is just going to town. It's producing ethanol. It's producing all other, all sorts of other metabolites that then other opportunistic organisms can then feed on. So it's um, it's a combination. It's a very complex interaction that you know we still don't fully understand. Um, but it's kind of like um, you can think of it almost like how you know we rely on the byproduct of other animals for for a certain food. So, I mean, cows produce milk for us, bees produce honey for us. Um, you know, then these are important food staples. Um, we rely on, on, on yeast to ter- convert, um, dough into bread for us to bake. So that's essentially what's happening at a microscopic scale in the, in the barrel. Yeast are producing certain, um, certain compounds that then other organisms can then use for energy and then in turn produce other compounds. Now these compounds, these metabolites, this is what gives beer its flavor. This is a very specific process that follow fairly well understood metabolic paths um, to produce compounds that we want. Now an overabundance of some com- or some organisms can produce an overabundance of unwanted compounds. So we have uh, um, a family of compounds called biogenic amines that these are nitrogenous compounds that are formed through biological processes that in large enough quantities can completely spoil a beer. And they have amazing sounding names like putrescine and semenine <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and cadaverine. <laughs> yeah. 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 I definitely want some of that in my beer. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's that's uh, fascinating. So so all right. So then we've got all these different. Uh, well, well, why don't we talk about then some? What are some of the common you know microbes and and mycobes? I don't think that's a word. But, <laughs> but mi- microbes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so what are some of the common <laughs> microbes we might find in in barrels? Uh, so most common are uh, Britannomyces species. Uh, those are very slow growing organisms. Um, that are notoriously difficult to get rid of and uh, 
once they're once they've established themselves in a in a barrel, it's pretty much useless for anything other than making beer. Um, because you really can't get rid of them. Uh, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you could probably find other species of Saccharomyces in there. Um, I see a lot of lactobacilli. So there's there's all kinds of different lactobacillus species. So uh, some of the ones that are most commonly associated with human activity, like lactobacillus brevis, uh, lactobacillus uh, dulbrechii, um, lactobacillus or Helveticus and Plantarum. Um, and uh, the, really the issue kind of arrives like when you're getting down to the bacterial level, it, it becomes very difficult to, to s- differentiate between species within the same uh, genus. Um, so they tend to be very diverse. Um, you, know, you can have your Acetobacter, uh, Gluconoacetobacter, um, see some other common uh, yeast or some other common fun- fungi are Saccharomycotes, um, Schizo or Schizo Saccharomyces, depending on how you want to pronounce it, the European or the American. Um, Wickerhammermyces, that's, that's uh, an interesting one that keeps popping up from uh, in, in barrels that was never really thought to be associated with beer. I mean, yeah, I could go on, but yeah, no, I no, I mean that that's a fascinating list. I mean, you 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 mentioned Britannomyces and Lactobacillus acetobacter. I mean, those are ones that I'm sort of familiar with, um, and then all of the other you know ones that that we that we don't know about. But each of those things, like you mentioned earlier, contributes a, a flavor, right, or um, or or an aroma or something like that that that's going to affect what the beer tastes like. Uh, like Britannomyces, I think of you know, barnyard and hay and wet blanket and that kind of stuff. And then, and then of course the lactobacillus and acetobacter are going to make it sour, right? Yeah. And each one, um, now we don't really, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to say like what each individual species or what each individual genera contributes to it. But we do know that the fact that they're all there, they're all, they must be contributing something right they're all interacting with each other in, in some way or another but we do know that 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 at least in in barrel aged beers that it's most likely Britannomyces that uh plays the dominant role in flavoring these because Britannomyces you know Saccharomyces is great it's a it's it's a really good organism um for just about anything that humans need to do I mean you know we make food with it. We can genetically modify it for to produce medicines. Uh, it's a good protein factory. Uh, but Britannomyces really, in terms of its genetic toolkit, kind of blows Saccharomyces out of the water. It, it, it is just such a wonderfully diverse genre that um, we can probably find a species or a strain of Britannomyces to produce just about any flavor imaginable. I mean, Oh, wow. I didn't uh, know that. (laughs) Yeah, no, they, they are, they are well prepared for extremely harsh situations, which is why they're so, um, they're so dangerous in like the wine world because they can remain persistent for years in a bottle of wine or in a bottle of barrel aged beer, um, and still continue to work very slowly, but, but they're very well equipped for these exceptionally harsh environments. And they'll just slowly convert whatever is available to them into, uh, energy. And then that itself will end up releasing other compounds, you know, breaking down one compound into another, uh, which, you know, humans will perceive as a different flavor. Right. Okay. Well, with all of these different, you know, Britannomyces species and, and like I said, Lactobacillus, Acetobacter, bacterial species and everything, I can certainly see why you wanted to look at a barrel um, and see what we could find, right? It, right in the barrel. And and there was a really great quote from your article that I thought uh, really summed it up well. It just said, over time, the beer microbiome and mycobiome change in predictable ways, but at different rates in individual barrels. 
barrels. And I love that because it says like, we can predict these things, but we, but we, we sort of can't. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I, which I love that. Right. So, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the study uh, that you set up and we'll see where we, where we kind of go with this. So, like I said, you did um, three different beers uh, that that you then either primarily fermented or aged um, in beers or had aged. I, I don't. It wasn't particularly you that was the one that was aging it, if I understand correctly. But uh, it, at least had that. So let's talk real quick about the sort of the wort that was produced in each of these. So the first one was an American Cool Ship Ale. What is that? So American Cool Ship Ale is a lambic style beer that is produced in North America. Um, I think it's just more out of respect for the Lambic tradition that it's not called Lambic. It's kind of like, you know, same way, like, uh, you know, you can make champagne anywhere, but you can't really call it champagne um, unless it's made in, in France in the champagne region. Uh, but I think that the nomenclature itself um, is fine. You know, like it's, I, I, I kind of like that, the idea that it's uh, that it's an American Cool Ship Ale, but it's produced in pretty much the exact same way that you produce a Lambic, which is produced using um, partial barley and partial unmalted wheat. And then it's mashed very slowly, very carefully. And the wort is then extracted and allowed to cool overnight in what is called a cool ship, which is an ancient method of chilling beer. And at the same time, inoculating it with the indigenous flora and fauna of, of your region. Now, originally, it was believed that it was specifically the microbiome of the Seine Valley of Belgium, just outside of Brussels, uh, that made lambic beer, lambic beer. However, we're starting to find more and more evidence that it's not, it's probably not the local microbiome. It's just the fact that the wort itself is a highly selective medium that is conducive for the growth of these specific organisms that make a lambic beer, a lambic beer. Oh, nice. Okay. I see that. So, so there's, so these organisms exist everywhere essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then, so by putting it into kind of, I, I'm not necessarily like outside, but just putting it out in the open and letting the beer cool in this like really thin cool ship, you inoculate that ye that beer with whatever is floating around in the air, right? We're not talking about pitching a vial of Sac Cerevisiae or a, a house culture or anything in it. You're just letting the air uh, do its thing and make beer. So this is, this is kind of like, to me, this is the example of how beer was made for thousands of years, right? Yes. Mm hmm yeah. All right. Yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, it is an excellent look at the history and the culture of, of brewing, you know, it's, and it's an important part, at least in Western uh, European history of, of just how people survived for, you know, a thousand, 1500 years, uh, because this beer was, it's very clean. Um, you know, yeah. it's, at one point, it was probably safer than drinking water. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. And then, of course, we didn't have, you know, stainless steel tanks back then and glass that was everywhere. So they were putting it in wood barrels or clay pots, you know. So I, so that makes sense. So this was a, a beer that was traditionally fermented uh, in oak barrels. And that meaning primary fermentation. So you would just, as soon as it was done, when the cool ship, transfer that thing right over into the barrel and let it rip, right? Exactly. Okay, cool. So that well, that makes sense. Um, why you wanted to look at this beer as a traditional example of primary fermentation in barrels? You also decided to look at aged sour ale, um, which uh, this one was a little bit different, right? This one wasn't inoculated in a cool ship. This one was actually inoculated in the barrels. As far as I know, yes. Um, so this was actually treated very closely to the traditional uh, lambic style of of production like at least the grain bill was very similar um although it wasn't exposed to a cool ship it was it was first allowed to undergo primary fermentation in stainless steel fermentation tanks because this was a beer that was produced for large-scale applications um, and then it was placed into separate individual barrels uh, for aging 
Okay, I see. So, so we we did a, a like a normal sac um, cerevisiae fermentation, an ethanol fermentation, um, and yes. then and then put it in barrels. Um, and so it wasn't sour at the time it was put into barrels. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All so right. It, it was it was allowed to undergo that natural process. Okay. And this one went for a long time, right? I, I think in your paper you said this one went for you know you had samples that were aged. Um, most of it would, the average was three years, but you had samples that were aged eight months all the way to 58 months. That's almost five years. Yes. Yeah. So some of these, yeah, this was a very long-term project and this actually was a very unique opportunity that afforded, um, Dr. Curtin's lab to be able to kind of condense this long-term study into, uh, about 18 months, which was, which was great. Um, because it was produced in a staggered way so i think like the first batches were were put into barrels in like 2011 at the time because we started the study in 2016 so yeah five years wow yeah five years in a barrel yeah yeah that's that's amazing too and so that one's really cool because then you get to see what really the long-term effects of of the storage is right like what what are what are what's going on um you know if we're letting things sit for 58 months that's cool Um, and then the third style, I love this one too because I have had myself many a, a barrel aged imperial porter. I love that style uh, of beer, um, and that's a great one that that does barrel aging. Um, you know, I haven't necessarily had an imperial sour porter, although maybe that's something that somebody could do. Um, but but I've definitely, I mean, maybe it has a little bit of lactic acid in it. But that's another great example of this barrel aging and the character that uh, these different microbes can put into beer especially the dark beer so this is another fascinating one that you looked at yeah and and our goal with this was um you know you said you're a fan so you probably had some pretty clean imperial porters that still had that oak that Mm -hmm. sort of barrel character to it yeah so that's kind of like what we wanted to use this as so this was a deliberately aged uh beer or this was a beer that was deliberately aged in used barrels um, that had been treated. So the barrels themselves had been treated in the, you, you know, using a sanitation uh, operating or san- sanitation standard operating procedure put in place by the brewery uh, to at least sanitize it as best they could. And these are the same kind of sanitation procedures used in the wine industry to hopefully, you know, essentially pasteurize the barrels. So kind of like knock down uh, whatever microbes, not necessarily get rid of them all. Cause you know, that would be almost impossible, but at least to significantly hinder microbial growth. So the idea for this was that this was kind of used as a positive control to see if like, or sorry, as a negative control to see if like, um, the barrels, if it's the barrels themselves or if it's the micro and the microbiome i see that's fascinating so what what character is just because you know there are flavor compounds in wood right and that that's being extracted into the beer versus what are the microbes or microorganisms contributing Mm -hmm. all right very cool all right and then so you collected samples from these beers and like i said it was an 18 month study so these beers were aged for um you know varying uh, levels at, that you took samples. And I wanted to just sort of touch on that real quick before we go to the break. How did you collect the samples um, and and how often? So that was probably the most difficult part. <laughs> yeah, I can bet. Um, so we collected, we collected samples four times uh, after um, specific periods. So I think it was like every six months um, we went and collected samples and to collect them, so we, we kind of had to work on, um, we had to make some assumptions. Uh, and these assumptions were that if an organism was active, if it, if it was metabolically active, it was, it was likely going to be in solution. So what we had to do is we had to collect the samples basically from a nail port that was drilled into the base of the barrel and we made sure that this was done at a consistent height for all barrels so we're talking three to four centimeters up you know from from the bottom rim inner rim of the barrel uh so because we we didn't want to disturb the beer we wanted to just you know we, we we didn't want to or we wanted to disturb the beer as little as possible 
And basically what we had to do was pull, pull the plug, allow, you know, maybe 15, 20 mils to flow through first before we started collecting the actual sample into sterile uh, field collection equipment. Uh, now, <clears throat> it's it's almost impossible in a in a wild situation like that to be completely sterile. So it's very likely that there has there is some background contamination, um, and that is kind of something that we'll talk about uh, later on when we talk about the results a little bit. Um, how we kind of like parse that out from everything else. Um, but yeah, so rather than like going into the barrel and disturbing the beer because some of these some of these barrels had um, pellicles formed at their liquid air interface, especially those that weren't topped off. Oh, yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, too, like some barrels were even lost during the process of collection too, because I mean we're dealing with with hundreds of barrels. So. Oh yeah, you know leaks yeah. or you know getting hit by forklifts and <laughs> all, yeah. all that kind of stuff. <laughs> or they get misplaced because yeah. Uh, this this warehouse was, I mean, I, I, the warehouse that these were primarily stored in, I think, had about 7,000 individual oh, barrels. In wow. It, so. <laughs> <laughs> this must be a massive warehouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, that was, that was one of the most fun parts, too, just going through that, especially like in August. Oh, yeah. Uh, in this warehouse, that was very little temperature control. So all of the whiskey <laughs> and the tequila and sherry and whatever was in these barrels before, like it's like permeating the air. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I bet it smelled, I, I, you know, I bet it actually smelled pretty good. Well, it all right. Smell really good. Yeah. Well, well, okay. Let's, uh, let's uh, take a quick break then. And when we come back, let's look and see what sorts of microorganisms you found in each of these three beer barrels. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. Anyone that has ever tried a barrel-fermented or barrel-aged beer is sure to note the unique characteristics that the barrel imparts. Well, today we're talking with Avi Shehevitz about his study sequencing the yeast and bacteria that give those unique characteristics to the beer. So uh, just a quick recap, you used next-generation uh, sequencing to profile the microbiome and mycobiome of three beers, and that's the American Cool Ship Ale, which was uh, spontaneously fermented, the aged sour ale, which did a primary fermentation, a uh, primary ethanol fermentation, and then a secondary fermentation in the barrels. And then your negative control, which was your imperial porter, uh, which had been, you know, sanitized and trying to see what the barrel contributes versus what the actual microbiome or micro microbiome uh, contributes. And you took samples over many, many months, some as long as 58 months. So I'm excited to get into the results. But one thing we need to talk about is this gen this next Next generation sequencing technology. So, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what you used um, and and how that played a role in your experiment? Sure. So, this will be this will be pretty condensed because honestly, you know, this this could be a lecture in and of itself. But <laughs> yeah. basically, um, we can think of of the sequencing in that we are looking at a very specific part in. Um, fungal and bacterial genomes and what we this is what we refer to as barcode sequencing so it's kind of like think of it like a barcode at a supermarket right like each item has an has a barcode that identifies it for whatever purpose um that it's used for so you know you ring it up at a counter like okay package of oreos a uh, gallon of milk whatever um so what we have, and these are this is basically an international agreement that we look at specific sequences within the genome. So rather than looking at the entire genome, which can consist of millions, if not billions of base pairs, we can 
greatly reduce the time it takes to sequence these populations by just looking at very specific sequences. And these sequences for fungus um, and for bacteria are in the region of the genome that encodes for ribosomal RNA or ribosomal DNA. And these are highly conserved regions. And what this means is that they are very resistant to mutations because any mutation that occurs within that area of the genome will be a terminal mutation. In other words, it could, it will most likely kill the organism um, if, you know, if a mutation occurs and it reproduces. So with that in mind, what we do is uh, once we collect our samples, we very carefully condense all the living organisms and all the biological material in there down into a pellet where we extract as much DNA as we can from that. And then from there, we perform a PCR where we basically amplify those specific regions of DNA. And then we extract that, pretty much normalize it. So then we have to like break the DNA apart. So we get the individual chunks that we've uh, that we've amplified and then kind of capture those. It's like the whole process is, it's, it's very in depth and it's, you know, you have to be very careful when you do it. Um, but then like we, you can submit that for, or what we did at, at for our studies, we submit, we submitted that to the, um, to the Oregon state uh, center for biocomputing and genomics where they performed the majority of our sequencing work. And basically they were the ones that were able to read and sequence all that DNA, which the raw, the raw data was then given right back to us. And we were able to kind of parse out the population dynamics of that. Um, and the important thing to notice is that we took this as a proportional value. So all things being equal, the PCR stage where we amplify the specific barcode that we're looking for uh, should work in a proportional manner. So we start off with a certain percentage of say like Saccharomyces cerevisiae DNA, we should end up with the same uh, proportion of that. Okay, I see. So at the end of the PCR, at the end of the amplification, it should be the same, right? Like we it should be the same. Okay. It's, it's definitely not perfect, um, but it, it does a very good job at kind of maintaining that proportionality. Okay. Well, I think you did a excellent job in about three and a half minutes of just <laughs> summing up gene sequencing. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that because now, I, I mean, and that's exactly what I wanted, right? I love that because I can think about this now as, um, you know, Oreos going across a conveyor belt um, sort of thing, um, <laughs> you know, and that's a good, and, and that really brings home a good point too. One of the things that we've, we've talked about a couple of times, and I'm going to mispronounce this word because I always do. Um, it's like genera henera, uh, you know, genus level. Uh, that, that's what I'm trying to say. So, <clears throat> so genus level, right? Again, this is like homo sapien. That's the homo part of it. That just means primate. And that's really all we're looking at in this study. And that's important because there are a whole bunch of species and even strains that when you get down, provide a whole bunch of different variation. And, and like you said, uh, you know, that that's, it's hard to differentiate those strains and species uh, very quickly. But what you're able to do with this, uh, looking just at the, the genus level, is take away some really interesting information and develop some trends. And so I think that was really the coolest, one of the coolest things about your paper. Um, and I kind of wanted to just start right there at the top. The, one, of the, one of the big takeaways was there was immense variability from barrel to barrel. And I wanted to see if you just talk about that generally. Yeah, so we were very surprised at, at just how diverse these barrel sets were. And we couldn't really link it to barrel types either. So that was the other thing. It was, it was very difficult to um, be able to confidently say that with a whiskey barrel, we expect this microbiome. With a tequila barrel, we expect this microbiome. With, uh, I mean, one of the more interesting things was the maple syrup. I mean, we had maple syrup <laughs> barrels, um, barrels that stored vanilla, st barrels that stored brine. I mean, Yum. Uh, th these, 
like the brewmasters who are in charge of this project, specifically the sour beer, the sour ale, um, were, uh, you know, they, they, they just, they just went wild about what kind of barrels they use. And, and in the end, they like produce a very good beer. Um, but yeah, yeah. Like in terms of bacterial species and fungal species, um, there was, there was just some things that kind of stood out that, that kind of threw us for a loop, just things that we never really would have associated with, with beer. Yeah. And, and that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, and, and it's kind of like that quote that I had set up at the beginning, um, you know, about you're able to predict, we were able to predict some things, but then, um, you know, not, not, not everything. Uh, when I was reading that quote from your paper earlier, and that's kind of what, where you start at here, right? There was immense variability from barrel to barrel, meaning like there might not be the same microorganisms, um, in each barrel, in each barrel. And that's not really tied to what was in the barrel, um, itself. But you were still able to take away some trends uh, from this and and come up with some cool things. So let's look first at that American Cool Ship Ale. Um, and why don't you sort of walk us through uh, the results of that uh, microbiome sequencing? Yeah, so going through that American Cool Ship Ale, that was one that had undergone uh, the classic or at least the traditional inoculation method. So it was allowed to cool overnight in a cool ship. Um, one of the things I should note, and I think I, I believe I did note that, um, in one of the appendices for this paper was that the way that this was fermented, it, it was first allowed to inoculate, and then it had to go into a stainless steel fermenter at first, uh, before it was transferred into barrels for aging or sorry, almost immediately after primary fermentation had finished. So there was very little influence in terms of of the primary fermentation due to wood. It was, it was the aging that was after that. Uh, and that was only because of the way that this fermentation was set up. They didn't have the barrels at the time. Um, so it was kind of like a last minute adjustment kind of thing. But this was one that, but this brew was specifically made as part of the study. So, uh, Unfortunately, that that kind of threw a small wrench into it, but we made it work. And uh, what we found was that the majority of the fungal species in place was Saccharomyces, or sorry, the majority of the fungal species was Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Britannomyces. And these kind of dominated at least the microbiome for, you know, the first quarter, you know, or first couple months before um, other other fun other fungi started to kind of creep in um, as far as the bacteria go uh yeah that's the thing that we saw almost immediately like like within 24 hours of cooling was the enterobacteriaceae sp species or, or you know the genera within that family dominated and this is this is exactly what we expected um this was what has been predicted for at least the last 40 years i think one of the papers that we based this on was a seminal work performed back in the 70s, which was really the first foray into looking at the microbiome of barrel-aged beers. And that was using entirely traditional microbiological techniques. Um, and these, these lined up very closely. I mean, which kind of really just shows how powerful these uh, traditional microbiological techniques could be. <clears throat> And so these Enterobacteriaceae, these are the primary souring organisms. And what happens here is that these produce lactic acid um, and maybe maybe succinic acid and, the, and some other organic acids, but it's predominantly lactic acid. And this almost drops the pH of the wort overnight down to about 4.2, depending on the composition of the wort. And what that does is that actually serves as a way of keeping the wort safe. So like once it gets down to that level or that, that level of acidity or that pH, um, you can't grow pathogenic organisms in it anymore. And that's a safe environment, very, very safe environment for fermentation. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae thrives at that, at that pH. It, it does 
uh, and, and oftentimes prefers lower pHs uh, than it does higher pHs. And this kind of like sets the stage. Those almost immediately die off because they, they just end up killing themselves due to um, acidification. Bacter or then the fungus takes over. That's when uh, primary alcoholic fermentation takes off. Saccharomyces cerevisiae will just outcompete everything else for a week or so before it slowly starts to die off just due to ethanol stress um, and lack of nutrients. And that's when we see the other slower growing, the more opportunistic uh, fungi come in, such as Britannomyces. And uh, this beer was absolutely dominated by Britannomyces after a month. Wow. So, so it started, so, you know, the, the Saccharomyces is there and it kind of just blows through the sugars, uh, that are, that are in the, in the beer and then Britannomyces in terms of the fungus like takes over right B between the two funguses. Um, and okay, well, and then what about the, the, well, I guess I should pause there for a second and say, you mentioned that that is, uh, you know, kind of what you expected. And I think that certainly is what, what a lot of uh, brewers see, right? Is you see Britannomyces certainly start to take over as you age longer, the Saccharomyces being more dominant up front. So that's pretty good, right? We know that we're, that we're, uh, they're noticing that. But one of the things that I always thought was interesting is you identified, you were able to actually identify 13 different um, fungal uh, species and seven different uh, bacterial species. So not, you know, even though they may be under 88% of them were under genus Saccharomyces or Britannomyces, but there's still, you know, 12% of other stuff uh, that's in there producing flavor compounds and, and aroma, I would expect. Yeah. Sorry, I just had to pull up a list of things because, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot to remember. Sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So one of the really interesting things is that we saw at least two distinct species of Britannomyces, which was kind of cool, uh, especially Britannomyces anomala, which um, it, as far as I know, hasn't really been associated with beer. Um, but I'm not sure if that's just because people haven't looked for it or... Uh, if it's just not really that common. Um, but the other thing that we found was uh, Pikia species. So th those are very common environmental contaminants. So Pikia is, is pretty much a catch-all genre for yeast that are very hard to classify. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, at least you know, hard to classify uh, genetically because it does get kind of difficult to start to differentiate between some species and even some genre of, of microorganisms just because gene swapping is surprisingly common. There's a lot of horizontal gene transfer. Um, but for the most part, for the most part, we can safely rely on that barcoding technique that we spoke about earlier. Um, but yeah, Pakia, that's that's something that we you know was not unexpected just because of how common it is. It's it's you know it's a common human uh, human born either opportunistic pathogen or it just kind of exists on your skin. It exists on surfaces. Um, Wickerhammermyces anomalous. That's another one that's kind of like an, it's just an environmental background contamination. Um, but the other interesting thing was the Hensenia spora. Or that, or species within the Hensenia spora or Hensenia ospora. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, uh, I don't. Gonna, I don't ever get them right either. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those those are associated with fruits. So that's something that was kind of interesting. That's that, that is something that you can find very commonly in orchards or vineyards. Um, I might be wrong don't quote me on this but i think it's mostly associated with wasps too like like that's kind of how it spreads oh wow huh. maybe there's um, a dead wasp in the barrel or something yeah. <laughs> just kidding <laughs> hopefully not all right well uh, okay and so you've identified all these uh, uh, you know all these new species identified that there's back that you know britannomyces and and lactic acid bacteria bacteria enteric bacteria all of that. What do so? What's a takeaway? What are what do those results tell us? Or at least looking at the American Cool Ship Ale, what does that um, biome tell us? 
So these follow very closely, like like this this population divergence, this population um, distribution that we've seen over the course of what was it, thirty six weeks, for this particular uh, American Cool Ship Ale, uh, followed very closely um, traditional lambic styles, uh, regardless of geography. So this was this was kind of like a side thing that kind of stood out was, you know, the, the claim that it's, it's the specific geography, it's the microbe or sorry, microbiome of the ge geographic location. That's that makes the beer, but uh, this might not be the case. Um, there are some very good papers put out by um, a researcher from, from UC Davis. I think, now he's at the University of Arizona. But anyway, Bakulich is, is his last name. Um, he did a lot of work with Charles Bamford on, on this like back in, uh, I think, 2012. Um, kind of looking at, at this in the same way, but with less barrel samples. So we kind of like um, built from there from a much larger. So we were looking at over a hundred different barrel samples um, compared to, you know, the smaller population that he looked at and the trend that we saw of uh, these specific general dominances over time, very closely followed the samples that he looked at and what is generally found um, over in Belgium. So we're looking at beers from Belgium, the East coast, and from the west coast of the United States. So you're looking at literally halfway around the world and you're still getting these same, uh, these same profiles, these same population dynamics that, that you would see in Belgium in the middle of the Willamette Valley of Oregon. <laughs> so that's fascinating, right? I mean, we think the world is a big place and that's a really, really under, you know, understated uh, uh, takeaway from this study is that, yeah, the, the microorganisms that were over, this was additional confirmation that the microorganisms um, exist in many places and, and you can create similar beers and styles. I'm not going to say that you can create the same, maybe you can, but you can create very similar beers and styles using the microorganisms that are in your local, uh, local area. Uh, now it might, um, the resolution of the technology that we're using is still kind of high or sorry, kind of low. Um, but there are methods to be able to uh, get down right down to the strain level. Um, and particularly when dealing with bacteria, that's notoriously difficult because bacteria, um, bacteria is very tiny <laughs> yeah. and that can affect how DNA is harvested. So when you look at, say, when you compare like a Saccharomyces cervicea cell to a lactobacillus cell. I mean, your your orders of magnitude bigger, with the you know the yeast is, or, is at least an order of magnitude bigger than the bacteria. So you're going to get a lot more genetic material from the yeast than you will from the bacteria, and that could affect um, the resolution of of at least the current state of technology. Um, now, if you're willing to pay for it, like like there are, there's much more in-depth se sequencing that you could do to get right down to the strain, like the specific strain level. And that's kind of like the next step. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly sounds like uh, opportunity for future research there oh, absolutely. To, to see yeah. the, you know, get down to the strain level. All right. Well, let's talk about the aged sour ale. Um, so remember, this one was aged for, you know, anywhere between eight months to 58 months. So this was our, you know, sort of like the long term um, example, uh, yeah. you know, were, was, were there, um, any different, any interesting, uh, or, or surprising results that maybe differed from, um, the cool ship or, uh, more of the same or both? Uh, so that was, that was very similar. Um, at least from what we were able to parse out based upon our testing methods. So just, just to reiterate, uh, so what we did was we were able to look, look at or sample these staggered populations or barrel populations, I should say. Um, and that kind of gave us an idea of, or, or that our hypothesis was that would give us an idea that would kind of give us like a very broad picture that we can then stitch together because we have samples that are five years old. Well, at the time they were five years old, we have samples that were two years old and we have samples that were less than eight months old. Right. 
Um, so we were able to get uh, kind of like these, these key time points. So we had the very old, the moderate, and then the fresh. And what we saw was that the older the barrels were, the more acetobacter dominant it was. So this was something that, that we kind of were hypothesizing would happen. Um, the, the middle-aged barrels, uh, the ones in the middle, tended to be more associated with um, lactobacilli and then and Britannomyces. And the younger ones tended to be, uh, like, we, we were actually able to see kind of um, the Saccharomyces start to die off or drop off, at least, and then Britannomyces start to take over, as well as an increase of the lactobacilli. Wow, that's cool. So you were actually able to see during the time period. So, so you know, I, I guess how long was it? You know, like, were we talking like, you know, 10 or, you know, 12 months, um, the Brett and the Lacto are like super dominant or, or, or yeah. something like that? Yeah. So like uh, um, Saccharomyces was kind of stuck around for a little bit longer than I anticipated, just based off of the American Cool Ship Ale. But there was definitely that same kind of trend that we saw. So starts off Saccharomyces dominant, and then once Saccharomyces cerevisiae kind of goes away, or you know, kind of settles out, dies off a little bit. That's when that's when uh, the bacterial population populations populations can start to bloom, as well as the um, the Britannomyces populations. Okay, interesting. Well, that that seems like a pretty cool takeaway too, because if you you've now shown uh, where and when each barrel um, may be ready, right? I, I mean, if you're looking for certain characteristics, if you're talking about blending these barrel beers and barrels together, if you're looking for these characteristics, you now have some guidelines about when uh, those barrels might be appropriate for packaging. Yeah. So that was one of the kind of the drivers for this, at least talking with other brewers and kind of like exploring the potential of this technology, because as this technology improves, as it becomes cheaper, as sampling becomes more reliable, um, one of the things that we can really do is like uh, for brewers who are invested in a large barrel program, um, they can get custom data on sets of barrels and see like how these clusters are doing compared to others and determine whether or not like, yep, that one's good for harvesting. It's, it's got the right profile. Um, we can use that for blending. Cause one of the things that we did find was that, yeah, some of the older barrels were essentially vinegar at oh, that point. Yeah. Like there was just nothing salvageable. Yeah. And I think about how this is done right now. Right. I mean, when we're talking about figuring out which if a bar if a barrel is ready to be packaged, it's a it's a person. Right. Like going around to each of these barrels, tasting it and then saying, yeah, it's ready or no, it's not. Right. Which is I mean, and these people who have done this have, have an amazing ability. Right. Their palates are incredibly sensitive and have oh, a really, absolutely. really amazing ability to pick out and blend and all that stuff. And that's that's something that. I was not blessed with as a gift that I do not have, um, but but it's an amazing ability. But this op this gives you an an opportunity to add some sort of objective data into that too, right? Like we know that if if we're around this time period, we should see a beer that is high in Britannomyces and Lactobacillus. And so if I'm looking for that, I may want to go and check those barrels first rather than walking through all seven thousand of the warehouse, you know, to try to find the right one, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, it, it's really not much of a deal, big deal if, like, you know, you're a small brewery and you have, like, 10 barrels, right? You sure, know, yeah. You're, you're just doing a small patch. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. Like, um, for these breweries, these larger breweries that are following these trends or that are trying to set their own trends, you know, you got invested 7,000 barrels um, of product. You know, that's a significant amount of time, uh, space and and money just kind of tied up. I, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you've got a whole a whole warehouse full of the stuff. And I mean, you know, losing barrels, um, especially even for a small brewer, losing barrels to vinegar is a big deal. Right. That's a that's a problem. Letting it letting it go that long. And I think even for small brewers, there's a takeaway here, too, which is you, you can now have sort of a general rule of thumb schedule that you could follow. Right. Like, you know. 
I, 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 I think about a, a barrel that's been sitting in the brewery, even if it's just five or 10 barrels, you know, I know that I want to check that beer after one year or I want to check it after 18 months because I want it to have, you know, sort of this flavor. And that's kind of a rule of thumb about like when I should be checking that beer for whatever flavor I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, this is kind of a stepping stone too into um, uh, just more automated sampling systems that you can use mm-hmm. e- for for just regular beer production. Uh, this this technology that we're putting or that is being developed that is that is being used for this project um, has immense potential for just the quality control of of just standard beer production. Um, you know, you could catch you could potentially catch spoilage well in advance just by being able to detect specific DNA um, with a very small sample size. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, And one of the things that I really hope to see evolve from this is more um, is more is, is just that kind of like using this as a stepping stone uh, because yeah, Right now, I would say that these kind of beers, they're very niche, right? It's not a market driver. These aren't things that are going to make a brewery, you know, a million bucks. It's more like that's that's kind of going to be like the interesting thing to bring people in. But the technology that was used to look at this, uh, to look at these beers, now that holds a lot of potential for for just large scale applications in quality control, making better beer. Um, looking for for new methods of producing beer uh or or, i mean hell even other foods too it's like anything that can be fermented oh yeah yeah i mean i i could certainly see that identifying the the microorganisms that are everywhere i like sourdough bread if i want a sourdough bread to taste a specific way or have the right crumb or crust uh you know might be able to even use it there. Okay, well, I want to uh, talk then too about the third, the third type, right? Then the I keep calling it the negative control, um, <laughs> but, but I, I don't mean that to sound bad. I, I think actually it was you that used that term, so I'm going to blame that on you. Um, but but uh, no, this is the one um, where we wanted to see w- what uh, you know was independent of uh, the microbiome. Uh, you know what 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 does the barrel contribute, or you know are we still getting uh, you know, micro, uh, microbe and myco, uh, in organisms. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So the, the barrel aged Imperial Porter, this was a very interesting case study and in that this was also, this was, we, we got an opportunity to look at this semi-fresh. So it had been in a barrel for at least nine weeks prior to when we first looked at it and we, um, looked at it, uh, twice. So we had two major sampling periods, nine weeks and 36 weeks. And uh, because it, it, this was not meant to stay in, in a barrel for, for five years, you know, this was, this was just meant to get the, the barrel character, get it out, bottle it, package it. Um, and this also represented the very large population of barrels. This is where we see things like the um, barrels that contained or that held vanilla extract barrels that contained maple syrup bar- barrels that contains um brine for some reason um i don't even know where they got those barrels from but <laughs> that was that was really interesting yeah it actually i mean just the beer straight from those barrels were actually it was actually really it was weirdly good it was almost like um salted caramel i was gonna say i could think i mean salt <laughs> uh, but brine is just salt and sugar all right so uh, yeah, yeah i would think that would be really tasty um and yeah what we saw was there there was a couple exceptions to the overall barrel population in terms of differences, but they were primarily dominated by Saccharomyces cerevisiae in the first nine weeks. And then we saw a very distinct decline in Saccharomyces cerevisiae and then a steep increase in Britannomyces, which isn't necessarily bad, but it just goes to show that like how hard it is to absolutely sanitize these barrels. Like you're, you're still going to get Brett in there no matter what because you're just not going to be able to get rid of it. Um, but what this tells us is that like, the, it's really not dependent on the barrel type. So these are, these, these microbiomes are kind of ubiquitous, like regardless of barrel type, because we tried looking at this to see is like, okay, is there a statistically significant difference between um, population distribution, uh, 
like the uh, mi microbial distribution um, versus yeast versus bacteria. Um, and yeah, we could not find a relationship. In fact, like we really only found one major bacteria population within these barrels, and that was Lactococcus. And even then, it really wasn't that dominant. Like it kind of showed up at nine weeks and then disappeared by 36 weeks. Huh, wow. Um, and that's where this comes in with the background uh, contamination or a potential background contamination, because we got lots of hits of all kinds of bacteria. And many of these bacteria are mostly associated with uh, dirt. So just oh. dust, um, surface contamination. And when we talk about the relative abundance of these, they were very low. So it wasn't really anything that we could uh, confidently show came from the beer. And it most likely just came from the fact I'm in a dirty warehouse surrounded by dust and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, stuff will inevitably get into my sampling. Uh, sure. Uh, my, my sampling tubes. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I guess, so kind of the, the, the takeaway there is, is that, that you were, the, while there was a microbial or, and my, myco, uh, you know, fungal, there we go. We'll say that, um, a fungal, uh, you know, not necessarily contamination, but, but inoculation from the barrels, even in, uh, this one that was sanitized, that was intended to be, uh, the negative control, which I think is fascinating. And that's also really a, a cool thing to know, right? Like we, we know now that even though we're, you, you know, uh, even though we're sanitizing these barrels, we're still getting the same microbes and uh, fungal or, you know, uh, bacteria and, and fungi uh, in, in the barrels. And that's also a really cool takeaway that it's agnostic of barrel. Um, you know, there is a time component to it. Uh, but those are really, really cool things that I think brewers can definitely use when uh, fermenting and aging in barrels. Mm hmm. Well, um, I, I we're running up on time, so I do. Uh, before we wrap up, I do want to ask um, if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's topic. What would that be? Oh man, what would that be? One thing I would say is uh, keep abreast of scientific news. Um, I would say like just see what's happening out there in 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 these research universities, and I mean not just not just Oregon state, my, my alma mater, but, um, there's some really great work coming out of, out of, uh, out of Belgium. Um, there's some really good work coming out of the UK. Um, so these are kind of like, are specifically, specifically geared towards brewing and, or yeast. Um, and this is kind of like where the future of brewing is going. I think that there will always, always be, um, that traditional aspect of brewing that will never go away, but more and more brewers are going to start to have access to new technology, um, new lab services. So I, yeah, I say keep an eye out for, for those kind of, for that kind of news. Um, Cause there's always something exciting happening. Yeah. And uh, I might suggest listen to episodes of the brew lab <laughs> for, too, for yes. brewing science news. Uh, all right. Well, uh, Avi, this was a, been a really fun uh, discussion. Is there anything else that you wanted to share uh, that we didn't get to talk about today? I'm sure there's a hundred things, but uh, anything <laughs> pressing? <laughs> Yeah, I wish I could have gone a bit more in depth in uh, barcode sequencing and high throughput sequencing technology because that is a fascinating subject. But well, uh, maybe we, we can, can get, save that for another time. Yeah, I was going to say maybe we can get you back on in, uh, for another episode episode of the Brew Lab. So, all right, Avi, well, thank you so much for joining us in the lab today. Listeners, in the show notes, you'll find a link to Mr. Shavitz's study titled "Barrel Induced Variation in the Microbiome and Mycobiome of Aged Sour Ale and Imperial Porter Beer," and that was published just last year in August twenty. 2020 in the Journal of the American Society of Brewing Chemists. If you have show feedback or show suggestions, send me an email at cade at brewlosophy.com and be sure to check out Brewlosophy's other show, the Brewlosophy Podcast, as well as the experiments and other fun things we're doing over at brewlosophy.com. <laughs>
The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.